Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us for the Forum on the Hill. It is my great pleasure to introduce Michael Kraus, who will be joining us today to speak about uh, being a modern renaissance man. <laughs> Michael has been a professional musician, a band and orchestra and choral director, vendor at Central Park, general manager of a comedy and music club, the co-founder of an international record label, and much more in the course of his fascinating career. Today, he is happily retired and resides in Chestnut Hill with his wife, but still takes time to share his love of music with those who attend his monthly music appreciation classes here at the Center on the Hill, Name That Tune. So I want to welcome, and thank you so much for being with us, Michael Krause. Thanks, Mary Angela. Uh, I was just telling uh, Betsy here that uh, I, I thought that it would be uh, uh, fun to do this and easy to do it, but uh, I had to really think about what I've done. You know, it, it starts to add up after a while, and uh, uh, I hope you uh, enjoy it. I wanted to say to Mary Angela, am I talking okay? You're okay. I'm just okay. Right in front of you. Am I talking too, too low? I'm going to turn it up. No. Oh, you are? Oh. Yeah. So I was, I was, uh, uh, I wanted to take an opportunity, this opportunity to thank Mary Angela. She asked me to do this about a year ago. I, we had met a few years ago uh, working on a project uh, for the Allen's Lane Art Center. And uh, of course, I, I do the, the uh, Name That Tune classes here every month for the most part. And uh, I see some of you who have been to them. I hope some of you who have never been to one come and enjoy it. Uh, let me start by saying, by pushing this button here, see if it works. Oh no, I gotta do it there. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Let's see which button you want. Technical difficulty. Oh, of course. Right. It's this guy. Oh. It's just the oh, little, the lower arrow, one. The little arrow. Oh, yeah. Where it all began. I'm already out. I'm so technical. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, where it all began. Good. Um, it all began my career, actually. Well, I should say it began in St. Louis, where I was raised and born in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, went to the public school system. And in sixth grade, I went up to the music teacher and said to her, uh, I want to play trumpet like my oldest brother. And she said, I'm sorry, I don't have any trumpets left. All I have left is a trombone. And I said, okay, I'll take it. And my parents uh, didn't have a lot of money, but they made sure that uh, if we wanted to take private lessons, they would find a way to pay for it, and they did. And uh, actually, I had three siblings, and two older brothers and a younger sister, and we all took up an instrument, and we all had private lessons. I was the only one who became a professional musician, but still, we all had a great time taking it in school and so on and so forth. Oh, I just wanted to, I almost forgot. Before the end of the year of my sixth grade, the music teacher had me play a solo uh, at the school on the stage with a band accompaniment. And it was called Cielto Lindo. It goes like this. La 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 la. That you know. That's the chorus. La la. Anyway, I just thought I'd tell you, but it was it was pretty easy for the trombone, thank goodness, and uh, it was fun to do. And my parents were proud in their eyes. So there you go. So that was my start through junior high and high school. I was in uh, all the bands 
that were made available and orchestra and uh, also took some choral uh, music too, studying a little bit of that as well. Um, I got a scholarship to go to summer music camp was my junior year of high school at the University of Wisconsin. And soon after that, when it was time for graduation, I got a scholarship to go to the University of Missouri. And they had a great music department. And so I went there and it was, it was good. That's where I sort of really got, got going. Um, one of my favorite classes at the university was conducting. And uh, I became musical director for several productions at the university. Uh, the Missouri Workshop Theater, I directed uh, uh, Once Upon a Mattress, The Fantastics, and Carnival. And the last night of Carnival, closing night, some fellow came backstage and was looking for me, I was told. And he found me, and it turns out that, it's funny how things happen, this is how my real professional, well, my job as a teacher where I started. And when he came in, when I was, when he came in, came in, when he came backstage, he said, he's looking for a musical director at a high school, in Puerto Rico. And I said, hmm, sounds interesting. Uh, where do you want to go from here? He said, well, I'd like you to come into the teacher placement office and uh, I'd like you to uh, have an interview with me. And I'll, before that, I'll look at your uh, transcript and so on and see what you've been doing. I said, okay. And we set a date, and I went in, and long story short, um, I decided to sign a contract and take off for Puerto Rico as soon as I graduated from college. So I did. And uh, now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to hit this thing. I told you I'm not great tech. Let's see if it works. Oh, that, that's, that's the high school where I taught. Um, that's the, sort of the main entrance to the campus. And all the hallways were outside, you know, in, you know, walking from class to class and so on, as you would expect uh, on a Caribbean island. Uh, he also told me a little bit about it beforehand to prepare me that they didn't have much of the music department. Well. You know, the band was almost non-existent. They just sort of had a pet band that played. And uh, that didn't bother me. Why? Because uh, you can only go up from there, you know. And so I was taught that in, in school, one of the important things they, they tell you. And uh, it turned out to be great. I was, uh, I was very energized by it. When it came uh, the day that uh, students registered for classes before s school actually started, I was there with all kinds of signage, recruiting people, trying to get uh, players from the football team to play in the band. You know, even if they didn't play a musical instrument, if it was a football player, I'd give them a, a, a drum or let them hit the bass drum if they could keep a beat. You know, that was it, their audition. I felt like if I got some sports figures, and same thing with chorus, I did the same thing for my choral classes. Uh, can you sing? Can you carry a tune? Why don't you sing da 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 da? So it was pretty good. And uh, the turnout, we grew pretty quickly. Uh, I even offered free music lessons to anybody who didn't play. And, uh, you know, they could always rent an instrument. You know, or we had somebody could give them. Not many at the time, but that grew also. They had very few music stands. I mean, like I said, it was tough. Not a lot of music, so I was busy ordering music, and marches, and so on, because 
I wanted them to have a marching band. They had a football team. How can you not have a marching band and do halftime shows? Uh, so that was important to me, and I wanted to make it happen. And uh, it turns out that within a month, I got a, a decent budget, actually, because that was the principal coming to do it, and the superintendent of schools wanted to have a good, strong music program, if possible. There were only about 500 students in the high school, and that included eighth grade. I taught uh, band, chorus, uh, music appreciation for the eighth graders, but they could also, if they played a musical instrument, come on in and take you. So anyway, let me just show you a few uh, pictures if I remember how to do this. Um, uh, we had the first, I should say this, we had the first um, fully uniformed, well, as full as we can do with the uh, budget, but fully uniformed marching band in Puerto Rico uh, in the high school. But anyway, here's some pictures of them. The one at the, uh, you see all the drums? A lot of them weren't playing musical instruments yet, but we had a lot of dr drummers. And there were a couple of trumpet players that were pretty good, and woodwind players, and trombone players that, of course, I worked with. And, you know, so anyway, uh, it all worked out. You see many drums, that's drummers, drummers, drummers. <laughs> but, and we come in, I remember that first, did I change it already? Yeah. That first year, this is a, here's a picture of the marching band. And that was me without a mustache when I was like 21, no, 22, I guess, or whatever. And uh, can you recognize the bottom right? What is it? An anchor. An anchor is correct. Hooray! And we played anchors away. Um, by the way, I, I didn't tell you everything about the school. It's a good time to do it. It was on an army base. Fort Buchanan in Puerto Rico. And before I, you'll understand also now, I'll backtrack a little bit why I took the job. <clears throat> I was told about the salary, which was the same pay scale as Washington, D.C., plus a 5% cost of living allowance. And additionally, um, I was given, a, a B, I, I lived in a BOQ the first two years. Uh, I've, actually, I could have stayed there longer, but I decided to move to a beach house eventually instead of that. But anyway, can you blame me? But the BOQ was great. Officers were in there. A, a few other teachers were in there as well. And uh, it was $35 a month with maid service in an air-conditioned BOQ. So that was cool. Also, there were, here's another reason I took it. You got officers club privileges. And the officers club was right across the street from the BOQ. And you got PX privileges. And you got commissary privileges, like a market. So, I mean, I thought I died and went to heaven. I mean, it was pretty, pretty cool. And uh, so anyway, and it was also wonderful that you know everybody kind of knows your name, you know, and so on on the base, uh, especially students. You know, when you're walking by, it's it's just great, and uh, I absolutely loved it. And I loved Puerto Rico as well. Uh, one of the reasons I did is because I was the uh, when I got there, I found out very quickly that I was the only bass trombone player on the whole island when I showed up. So I knew what that meant, more dollars and also a lot of experience playing my horn, which I wanted to do. Um, and I also knew that there were a lot of uh, hotels, a lot of nightclubs and stuff like that. So I was excited about that. And uh, about after I got settled in the, uh, well, let me see if that's soon enough. I told you enough about the Barney base, let me think. Da -da 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 -da. Oh. I also put on shows with, uh, um, or they put on shows, but I organized what was called Showtime AHS. The school's name was Antilles High School. And um, some guitar players, 
both acoustic and electric. We put on like a variety of show of music that was popular at the time. You know, this was in the mid 60s, early 70s, uh, sitting on the top of the bay, watching all the crowd, you know. Anyway, it was good, it was great fun for them and great fun for me. And I figured if I got a job in a nightclub or something like that, this will, uh, you know, I could bring stuff back for, I could, you know, I could say to the principal, hey, if there's a rehearsal on a day, which I did do, um, can I get time off, da 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 da, I'll, I'll give it back to the school and give me an okay. So that was a cool thing too. It wasn't a very often, but uh, um, but often enough. Um, okay, let me go to uh, the club that I auditioned for, and it wasn't really an audition. My audi it was, but my audition was playing uh, a show, I mean immediately, which I did, and it wound up that I was there seven nights a week, and uh, uh, two shows on Friday and Saturday nights at the El San Juan Hotel, the biggest uh, supper club in the Caribbean, the El San Juan Hotel. Now this picture, uh, I'll give the photo credit to my wife Kathy, because this was taken about 20 years ago, maybe a little early, as you can see. Um, I wasn't 22 years old even in this picture, the one on the left is the front of the hotel, and that's the club I used to work at. When we went there on vacation, I had to take her where it was and gave her a little tour. And uh, it, was a, it was a really nice supper club with dancing and everything else. I didn't play for the dancing. I couldn't do that, didn't want to do that. I just, uh, and it was a smaller band anyway. I was just there for the, for the big shows. I think I'm going to show you some of the people I played for. There's the band, and this is interesting. Uh, they're on the left, of course. On the right is Jose Feliciano. I'm sitting down with him and uh, uh, backstage. But uh, let me see if I can play this. Oh, I don't know. Start the middle. What? Oh, okay. see that guy? Yeah. He was the band director. Uh, orchestra director. His name was Anselmo Sarkasis. The other guys were, sa you know, woodwind player, saxophone, and I'm in there somewhere. Where are you? There. Uh, the, the interesting thing about this band was they were all Cuban. I was the only American. So, you know, and they talked pretty fast. And I did take Spanish in uh, high school for two years, but that didn't help when I was backstage hardly at all because this was already out of college, and yada, yada, yada. And, uh, but I was able to start taking lessons at lunchtime with a Spanish teacher. So uh, I started to get it and could at least speak, con and even to this day, speak, can speak conversational Spanish, but still not so fast. Uh, but I understand pretty well. Anyway, those are some of the guys, and that was me. And I'm going to show you some more pictures of some of the other people, and then I'll tell you a few, few stories as I go along. These are some of the pictures that are in my, uh, actually in my music room that uh, my wife had framed and gave them to me as a gift. Um, on the right is Sammy Davis Jr. Course, and uh, that's me still without a mustache, so it must have been my first sight of years then. And on the left was his protege. Her name is Lola Falana. And uh, Sammy got her uh, a gig in Las Vegas and, you know, took care of her. And, uh, you know, it was great. Uh, rehearsals. At the first rehearsal, on the aisle, here's something I remember. Sammy Davis started yelling up to the uh, 
light, lighting man, because it was sort of a dress rehearsal. Not a full rehearsal, but a dress rehearsal with lights and stuff, for sure. And uh, he got upset because they were putting the spotlight with a gel that was, on one was green, and another was blue. And he said, don't you know to never put those kind of colors on a black man? He said, he said I want only a white spotlight. And you condemn it, this, to that, what I'm performing. And uh, he had his reasons. And if you ever see him uh, in a show, you'll, you'll probably, oh well, I mean, if you ever saw him in a show, you would know that uh, that it was always a white spotlight and white lighting coming out. On the left is uh, Paul Anka. Uh, actually, he, he wanted me to travel with him, and I said, I, I just started teaching, and I have a you know contract. I said, I can't, but I was flattered anyway. On the right, does anyone know who that is? That is correct, Bobby Darren, and uh, I loved him. I left playing for him. A lot of the people that came uh, to the hotel, they performed for a week to 10 days, more or less, most shows, sometimes two weeks. And uh, that's a good thing for a musician, I think. It was for me, because you get to read some of the best charts in the world, the best music by, by composers in the world for some of these people that were performing. And uh, Paul Anka, Bobby Darren, as you know, Paul Anka also was a composer himself. Uh, he wrote uh, the, the, the lyrics for Frank Sinatra, for my way. And uh, he also wrote The Longest Day. I don't know if any of you remember that movie. But uh, he wrote the music for The Longest Day as well. And Bobby Darren, of course, somewhere, Beyond the Sea, and uh, he also did Splish Splash, I was taking a bath, long about, anyway, a lot of good stuff. Let's look at some more, some more people I've worked for. Some of them signed them for me. Uh, that's Leslie Uggams on the left side. On the right is Tony Bennett. On the left here is Eddie Fisher. And on the white, uh, on the right side is Shirley Bassey, Goldfinger uh, was the song she sang uh, in the movie, the James Bond movie. And of course, Eddie Fisher, Oh My Papa, and uh, songs like that. So, uh, nice guy. And uh, oh, you know, everybody knows. When I do my Name That Tune class and I talk about some of the people singing, I'll talk about maybe uh, what movie they were in, or, you know, who were they married to? If it was Eddie Fisher, I'd say, who, who famous was she married to? Trivia. Answer if you want. We forgot? Who said it? Liz Taylor? Liz Taylor is correct, yeah. So that's one. So I get points and name that to sort of. And I'll go up to people and you know give them a high five and so on and so forth. But anyway, uh, let's go on. Not yet. On the left is Tom Jones, but I didn't play for him. I have to be honest. It was at a party afterwards. Uh, he came to see one of the other performers. He was in town, but he wasn't performing at the uh, El San Juan. And. Uh, uh, I figured I would get a shot of him because uh, he was pretty popular at the time, and I guess still is. Oh, I wanted to go back. Well, I don't have to go back. I don't want to play with this too much. <laughs> but I do want to say that uh, when um, I also played for Bobby Darren uh, on a record team, and uh, back in New back in New York, oh, I'm telling you, I went to New York after this, back in New York, and uh, he, uh, it was a great date, but unfortunately, a couple weeks after that, he died, he was just 37 years old. 
Okay, next to, next to, sorry, I got off track. Next to Tom Jones, we have uh, Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. And Joe Long, the guy on, to the right of Frankie Valley. I used to sometimes take people, take entertainers and people around the island because I feel like they're stuck in a hotel, they're performing. And uh, so he was the bass player for Frankie Valley, and he had his family with him too. So I took them around a bit. They even came over to the beach house. Oh, let me tell you about this beach house I had. Uh, after a few years on the base, I decided, you know, I gotta get out. I gotta. Da, da, da. I got it for hundred and thirty-five dollars a month. Now, that's not today's day, uh, prices, so obviously. But um, it had three terraces overlooking the ocean, and it was the second floor. There was people living below me, and I had the upstairs for hundred and thirty-five. But the best part is, it was local. Uh, it was right on the beach, and I could walk to the El San Juan. Yeah. It's almost like I shared the same beach as the El San Juan Hotel. And they knew me over there, so I could go in the pool there. And it was just unbelievable. Uh, not only that, I could get a lot of dates, you know, uh, on the beach and so on and so forth. Anyway, let's move on and see who else I have here. Uh, Robert Goulet is on the left. And that's another one of Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons, just another another shot. I think one is signed by each of the guys in one reason. But I like them a lot. Okay, I did go to New York. That's uh, the end of my bit on Puerto Rico. And I better keep moving. I'm glad I, uh, I thought I had it, but I don't have it anymore. But, um, I think I'm still running pretty good on time, right? Halfway. Oh, I'm halfway. Well, that, that gives me a tip. I better move a little faster. Um, I saw an ad in the New York Times after I decided to leave Puerto Rico. And uh, I left uh, after almost about seven years, almost eight years. And uh, I left because um, I missed the change of seasons a little bit after a while. But more importantly, I, it, it was 35 miles across by 105 miles long, more or less. And that was it. And, you know, I missed the mainland. I missed, you know, I missed the U.S. And uh, although I should say that I was able, being a teacher, I'm going back to Puerto Rico here, so forgive me for what's up there right now. But it gives me... Uh, gave me a chance to, um, come on with me. I do this and I practice what I do because it's good for cognitive skills and that's why I do mainland too. But I wanted, to, I, I wanted to have a little more adventure. I wanted to see some friends. I wanted to go to the U.S. Back in Puerto Rico, I did travel though in the summers. That's where I was at. I did get back. Now, I get a little credit. Not 100%, but anyway, um, I traveled to Europe for six weeks. I went to uh, all the Caribbean islands, and uh, I went back to St. Louis to visit with my family sometimes. I went to New York. It was all good, all good. And I liked, you know, I liked adventure, I liked to travel. Before I even went to Puerto Rico, for my first job, I went to Mexico City on a train from St. Louis. Anyway, Carl Fisher is a very well-known, reputable uh, music publisher of educational music, choral music, and sacred, and uh, does a lot of method books. In fact, the, the method book I studied was uh, uh, an Arben book by Carl Fisher for travel. Here's the picture of the building. You can still see it pretty good. My office was on the mezzanine, and uh, on the fourth floor was the printing floor, and it was great. I was the uh, I saw an ad in the New York Times when I got to New York, and went in, and I luckily and fortunately got it 
a job there and uh, had a great time. Uh, I think what I'll do is go back to this for a minute. Yeah, 72 to 77. And uh, did a lot of things. It was on the, uh, the submission, uh, the music submission committee. Had a chance to select what we should or should not publish. And a lot of good stuff like that. And uh, did, did a uh, MENC show, Music Education, Caters National Conference, and helped promote the music of Carl Fisher. And it worked out that it was great for me. Uh, now, are you ready for this? The reason I left Carl, or Carl Fisher was because it wasn't enough money. I had recently married, um, uh, had a son, and another was on the way, and I had to make more money in New York. I mean, it was simple as that, and it just, it, it wasn't enough um, in the publishing business. The publishers didn't pay that long. But it was still a great experience. So, not having a lot of money, I decided to do a lot of extra part-time work. I got some things in music, but not a lot because I wasn't the only bass trombone player in New York like I was in Puerto Rico. So it was kind of tough. I used to have to sub every once in a while and things like that. Anyway, who, who gets in the, oh, so what did I do? I drove a taxi cab, and that, that was pretty good money. I didn't do it full time, but I did it part time, but it was still good money while I was still at Carl Fisher. And um, who gets in the cab is a guy who comes in and I start talking to him, as I did sometimes, uh, because I was on the hunt for another job again. And who gets in but a guy who is a business consultant for a roller skating company that was renting roller skates in Central Park. And he said, they're looking for a manager. Would you like to do it? And how would you like to come in and meet the owners for an interview? And I thought to myself, what have I got to lose? And I said to him before that, before I said that, I said, you know, I don't know that much about roller skating. He said, oh, good. I said, why? Well, because they were, you know, losing a lot of roller skates and wheels and bearings and stuff out of the pro shop. Um, so we want someone to run a tight business there and be in charge of the skate rentals. The skate rentals were great, too. Uh, we'd have lines in New York and Central Park. It was right in the heart of Central Park. Um, it was called the Good Skates. And right off 72nd, not far from where uh, I lived with my two, two boys at the time. On the right side is the uh, other side of the skate rental, which was food service. Um, it was run by another company. But uh, the Parks Department gives out bids on all of these. So anyway, uh, we had the roller skate side. However, when our bid came up, um, they have to put it up for bid. So it was about three years with the good skates. So what happened was they next uh, hired another company called TAM Concessions, T-A-M. The owner of Tan Concessions came up to me and said, he didn't know anything about roller skates or roller skates. I did by now, and I started to even skate a little bit. So uh, he said, would you be interested in staying on? Well, it turned out that that first three years that I did it, you just don't know. If you turn left instead of right, your whole life can change, you know? And you're lucky, and, and, you know, if you're opportunistic, and, you know, and I wanted some change, and trust me, I got it. So, um, it was fun. I, I did shows, I did musical shows there. I had uh, skaters, the best skaters in New York, 
There's a small rink in the back. This is the small rink in, in the back of that same building. And you can see how mod it was back there. And uh, this was a special event by a DJ that knew a lot of people, so he really packed it in. But anyway, it was great fun. You can still see the rainbow. That was one of the uh, for good skates. That's the entrance uh, back there. People would line up outside the doors and go in to get their skates. We had 400 pair of rental skates. And if you're renting skates, then you're not giving out product. You can use them again, provided you take care of them and you have people that are working on it. And I got that going. So it worked. You know, it, was a, it turned out to be a pretty good business. Uh, that's me with a mustache on the left eating a piece of chicken. And there's some of the roller skates. On the right is me also, because the new company that took over, after about two months of seeing me work in the roller skating side, asked me to come to the food side and also run that and manage that. So I was doing that. Wait till you hear what else it turned into. Turned into 10 years in Central Park, just because I took a gamble and a risk, left Carl Fisher, and started renting roller skates. I mean, had my mom still been alive, she probably would have said, what are you doing? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to the next one. Then from, from that, still part of the business, I, I ran out of that same little place, uh, a merchandise business, merchandise uh, I started myself. And I had a friend who had this logo, who owned it. And she said, why don't we work together? And I said, sounds good to me. Long story short, again, I got the push carts, you know, like the supermarket push carts, one went on the front, two in the back, and had a post on each side with holes, put a hole on the post on each side, put dowels in it, and hung the merchandise from there, t-shirts, sweatshirts, uh, all with this logo. I love Central Park carts and uh, it, kids' t-shirts. I mean, the works. And, oh, that's, uh, I would have the vendors if they somebody famous came by. This is one I still have. Mary Tyler Moore, who signed it. So we used to get people coming by. And I had, I started selling that stuff myself for about a month across from the Plaza Hotel was a test. And uh, right there, um, not directly across, but at, the, at that entrance, sort of across, but di diagonally across, in Central Park. After that, I went back, uh, I got the permit from the Commissioner of Parks. I went back to him again and said, can I get some more cards? Because they looked good. They were all painted white. They had the big logo on the sign, I love Central Park, had a white umbrella. It, it looked really good, and it had to because it was had the, all the apartments on Fifth Avenue, Central Park South. You know, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. Anyway, I'm going to stop looking at the notes and just keep going. Uh, from, oh, so I, I did that too. By the way, I also did location shoots at the boathouse on the right side. Um, we got that, TAM concessions, got that concession also. They were very, very good. And I didn't have to go over there and run it because I wanted to stay at the Little Mineral Springs Pavilion. I had built up uh, customers I liked. And, you know, I liked the skate business by then, and I liked the food business. Anyway, on the left is uh, uh, Arquette. What's her first name? Rosanna, thank you. Was Anna Arquette, and she was wearing one of our strawberry fields. That I des had designed myself by a friend of mine, because at the entrance to Central Park on 72nd, that's where that's where Strawberry Fields is. That uh, Yoko Ono donated uh, a part of the land and built it up, and that's where they have the Imagine uh, on the ground in Central Park right there. And she fixed up that whole area. And I used to see her all the time, uh, Yoko and John Lennon walking into the park and walking by our concessions and stuff. So 
It was good. Um, I was nearby when he was shot at the Dakota also, so that was very sad. Anyway, the boathouse, we got the row, uh, you know, boat rentals, of course. Uh, we had the restaurant cafe there. That's where I did location shoots. I, uh, I would negotiate for those. And uh, because the company wanted me to do that, so I didn't mind doing that. And uh, I did the location shoot for when Harry met Sally with Meg Ryan and Billy Crystal. And uh, it was cool. We also did the food for them when they had their breaks and all that kind of stuff. So it turned out good for everybody. Uh, from Central Park, my next venture was uh, I left Central Park because I saw an ad that would get back to what I wanted, a little more what I wanted to do, to manage Catch a Rising Star. Uh, it was on between 78th and 79th on First Avenue. It sat 180 people. I got the job. What can I tell you? I guess I interviewed pretty well most of these uh, most of these jobs, and uh, had a lot of really, really good people. I did write down some of their, all their names so I wouldn't forget them. But, uh, oh, there they go. Uh, well, you'll know a lot of them, but anyway, uh, Robin Williams, there he is. Um, we had all kinds of promotions for Catch Your Eyes and Star. Here it comes. Did I change it already? Oh, geez, sorry about that. I'm changing it. Okay. Uh, it was a legendary comedy club. Also, there was uh, uh, the improv, uh, the, uh, the comedy cellar, a lot of different ones. And uh, I used to have to bump people sometimes when a big star came by and wanted to work on this act. Um, people like, uh, well, on the right is Pat Benatar, and that's her on the left with Robin Williams also at a big charity event that we had there. And uh, that's the band, some of the band that she brought with her. She was very popular. On the left, anybody recognize him at all? He was very young then. John Stewart from the morning show, and then he had to, did the late night show. And on the right is Seinfeld. I don't know who that woman is in the middle uh, between me and Seinfeld, but I, you can see, see I, what a big mustache I had a long time. Of course, my wife immediately had me cut it, cut it, uh, make it small. Uh, oh, I want to tell you some of the people. Quick. Adam Sandler, Ray Romano, Eddie Murphy, Rodney Dangerfield, I've got a story about him when I finish this list. Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle, Louis Black, Joy Behar, and Sarah Silverman, and many, many, many more. Um, the quick story about Rodney was he came by one night, got out of his limousine. Dangerfields was right about two blocks down, uh, more than two blocks, but maybe 10 blocks down also on First Avenue, the other side of the street, Dangerfield's Comedy Club. He got out of the cab, his short, I'll never forget, white, short sleeve shirt, and he gets out of the cab and he comes in and says, Michael, I said, what is it, Rodney? I have to go to the bathroom. And I said, Rodney, I'll give you two choices, being the good general manager that I was. Two choices, one is, you go to the Chinese restaurant next door, or you have to go down to the basement to the slop sink. Well, the slop sink is where all the beer stuff goes in, in the tubes and stuff like that. So he said, and, and because I thought he didn't want to go through the club, and he didn't. Plus, he was a little stoned, and, you know. Uh, uh, it just, you know, I don't know what he was doing, but he didn't look so good. So I said, you can, uh, those are your two choices. So he says, okay, I'll go down in the basement. So I made sure to take Ku with me and him to make sure that he's okay. You know, it's a, you can get a lawsuit in two seconds. So 
We go down the steps, my office was right down there, and the slop sink was over there. And all of a sudden I hear him screaming, Michael, Michael. I said, what is it, Rodney? He said, I can't get, the sink is too high. I can't really go wee wee. He didn't say wee wee, but that's what I'll say here. And, and he said, I can't get up. Being the good general manager I was, I said to Ku, who was a black belt in karate, I said, please get a milk crate, Ku. And he went and he got one, put it over there. And this is just the visual that I got that night, better than some of the stuff I saw on stage. He's standing on top of the milk crate, going to the bathroom, and Ku is behind him, holding him on both sides so he doesn't fall off. His head is bent over from the pipes and some more basin. Anyway, I got a real kick out of that. <laughs> anyway, so let me move on, right, Mary Angela? You wonder why this can respect. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> okay. Oh, I got it. Then one night at the hotel, at the club, nightclub, I forget where I am anymore, at the comedy club at Catch a Rising Star, a guy I knew for maybe 15 years. Uh, in New York, came over, it was a longtime friend, came over, sat at the bar, and told me that he had a, uh, uh, had something he wanted to tell me. He told me he wanted to start a record label, and he didn't want to do it without me. He knew my background and so on. So this is the first time I didn't have to go on an interview, he just came over and said, I want to give you a job. Well, he told me what he paid me, and it's a lot more than I was getting. I catch a rising star, so I was moving up. He made me a partner with the company. And, uh, but anyway, um, I th he said, oh, let me tell you the story behind this. These are some of the visuals. We had a great artist, her name was Nicola Heimel from London. Uh, he said he walked into one of his clothing stores. He had all clo he had clothing stores then, called Pudumayo. And Pudumayo is a river and a valley in southern Colombia. And he used to go there, and he thought it was so beautiful. He used to bring back folk art and, uh, uh, and sell folk art in a small little store on the other side. But then uh, uh, he changed over to clothing because he saw that sweaters started to sell. He's got some sweaters from the vendor. And then he, it got bigger and bigger, long and and. He opened a store on the east side, the west side, down in Soho, and three other cities nearby, D.C., Princeton, New Jersey. Anyway, the clothing was all natural fiber clothing from India, Sri Lanka, and Delhi. But the patterns looked like different countries from around the world. He walked into one of his stores in Soho, and the music playing was hard rock music. And that's why he wanted to kind of not do it, in his head. He started making tapes together. I helped him with some compilation tapes. Put it on, and uh, it changed the whole atmosphere and dynamics of the store. People, uh, the manager told him of the store that customers were coming up to her saying, what is that like? Where can I get it? That's when the record label came in. And, so we started it. We flew off, flew off the road. Neither one of us knew about the record business, but a friend of Dan's from Social Venture Network and Businesses for Social Responsibility that he had met recently um, was the president of Rhino Records, which did compilation labels. They helped us with our first two. I'm going to be talking fast now, right? You know oh, very fast. Okay. And, uh, and we expanded. We gave the charities, we gave over a, a million dollars to different charities on the sale of the CDs. And uh, it was terrific. We did, I did a lot of trade shows, we did a lot of events, uh, Carnegie Hall, and uh, you know, with some of our artists, I traveled around the world. Oh, let me show some pictures here. This is a, when I would do the trade shows, that's what it looked like. We sold this, had listening stations. That was at the Grammys. Mary McKeeva from South Africa. I was up for a World Music Award. This was me in Senegal, and you know, Mal, and so on and so forth. We were at his compound, and uh, 
I went to Australia five times. I can't tell you how many places all around the world I've been to as a result. So this was, I got my travel in. Uh, this is uh, me in, in uh, Thailand on the left. Uh, my wife and I were there. Uh, I brought her to some of these places. Uh, she used to say the furthest she ever got before me was uh, Camden, New Jersey. But uh, we traveled a lot together, and uh, I brought her over whenever I could. And that was us at an elephant farm. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I enjoyed it. Uh, pressure was on. I've got a lot more if you come to come to classes at uh, name that two classes. Uh, Did you ever count the number of countries you've been in? Uh, I would say about 30, 35, um, maybe 40. Uh, some I repeated several times. I'm sorry, I'm glad you asked a question. Anybody else have some question? Yes. What was the address? Betsy. That's Betsy. She comes to my class. Go ahead, Betsy. What was the address of the Fisher Museum? Uh, 60, uh, 6062 Cooper Square. It was in Cooper Square, which is the Lower East Side. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So our finance guys, let's all ask this question. So you had so many awesome things. How did you, how did you kind of... Juggle them. Altogether from a financial perspective, and you're obviously you were selling good, you were doing this, and did you find you were doing awesome stuff? Did you find it hard to really make a living doing it, or not so much? No, not too much. I went teaching, paid pretty well. Uh, playing my horn, played professionally, played paid pretty well in Puerto Rico, for example. And uh, you know, every one of my jobs paid okay, just not what I wanted to make in New York because it was quite a, you know from what I was paying in Puerto Rico and living there. And, and making on the same pay scale as teachers. Teachers are making some good pay these days, and they were then too. And, uh, and uh, you know, I was paid well for, I became a partner of the businesses in Central Park uh, pretty quickly. I was right away with the one, and I was with the first one, uh, and then I was made a partner of the, uh, of the TAM concessions also. So, you know, I was starting to put some money in my Did you have a lawyer helping you, or you just... My brother. Shaking? My brother, who's, oh, okay. a, who's a lawyer, yeah. That's the answer to the first question. You had somebody uh, taking care of all of them. Yes, and several jobs, that I, not jobs, but businesses I wanted to start. And he always saw the downside, or it had to tell me the downside, so I never really jumped at any of them. But, uh, yeah, and he helped me with a lot of stuff. God bless him. So, I don't have a question, but I'm going to share with our audience here our, my small world story um, with you, Michael, because I lived in Chicago before moving to Philadelphia, and I worked for a company called Jimbery Play and Music. You could use Put the Mile CDs exclusively in all of their classes. So, I had several of these CDs at home, etc. And then um, uh, when I moved to Philadelphia, my first roommate here had worked as a PR person for Vizmaya in New York. And then, through Alan's Lane, I was introduced to Michael and then found out who he was and was like, oh, I have been like steeped in your company's work for a very long time. And I already felt like I was, you know, meeting a celebrity. So that's the, the small world story that I have and that's, you know. Yeah, well, we're very lucky to have Mary Angela here at the Center on the Hill. and. Uh, I was delighted that she asked me to do this, and uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.